Skyline Wilderness Park is a beautiful 850-acre swath of countryside located in Napa, California. It offers an amazing range of recreational opportunities. Horseback riding, disc golf, archery, hiking, nature education, and our favorite activity, mountain biking. But it only takes one visit to realize that the past has a presence here. Mysterious ruins are tucked into the hills and along the outskirts of the park. Some appear to be 20th century. Others might be older. My goal was to see what I could learn about these structures. Why are they here? What was their purpose? I read Prestonary's excellent book, combed through digital newspaper archives from the 1800s, and visited the Napa County Historical Society, which is a mini museum unto itself. The history of this area is fascinating and more than a little bit haunting. And it all goes back to Imola. Napa. When you hear that word, what do you think? Well, wine, of course. It's hard to imagine a time when Napa Valley wasn't synonymous with delicious fermented grape juice. There was an era, however, when the phrase, going to Napa, didn't mean you were going wine tasting. Instead, it meant that you had probably Lost, Lost your, your mind. mind. Let me explain. During the mid-1800s, the state of California had a crisis. The state's first insane asylum, which began operating in Stockton in 1853, was desperately overcrowded. Originally designed to accommodate 600 patients, it housed more than double that number in 1873. You see, the gold rush of the 1850s had taken its toll on the population. There was the sheer influx of people. The gold rush was the largest mass migration in U.S. history. It was accompanied by disease, malnutrition, alcoholism, and depression. Some have speculated that mercury, which was commonly used in the extraction of gold, also contributed to the rising cases of mental illness. So a commission was established to find a site for a new asylum that would take the pressure off of Stockton. And that site turned out to be Napa. Cayetano Juarez, a Californio who owned Rancho Tulake in Southeast Napa, sold around 200 acres for the purpose of building this new asylum. It came to be called Imola, after a scenic town in Italy that also had an asylum. Work on the main building began in 1872. It was an absolutely massive structure. Dubbed the castle, this Victorian palace took 10 million red bricks and seven years to finish. Now the physical layout of the asylum castle, believe it or not, was intended to be therapeutic. This stemmed from a movement called moral therapy. Moral therapy proposed that patients be given compassion, dignity, and a pleasant environment with fresh air and activities. A contributor to this movement, physician Dr. Thomas Story Kirkbride, promoted architecture as therapy. The floor plan of Kirkbride buildings, as they came to be called, looked something like this. It was called the Batwing Plan. The design was meant to provide maximum fresh air and sunlight to the wards. 
More difficult patients were kept in the farthest wings, and as they improved, they were moved closer to the center of the building, where administrative services were located. In this picture of the Napa Asylum, you can see its batwing shape. Physical activity was also prescribed as a part of moral therapy, and the Napa Asylum was well equipped to provide it. Patients excavated the lakes, they harvested fruits and vegetables, and raised livestock on site. In some ways, the asylum was a town unto itself, and it was the defining feature of Napa for decades. Over the years, the acreage expanded to more than 2,000 at its peak, and there were more than 300 structures at one point. But it didn't last. The castle was declared a fire trap and demolished in 1950. A more practical building took its place. Currently hidden behind a high security perimeter, the facility, now called Napa State Hospital, treats mostly forensic patients. By 1979, the land next to the hospital was declared a surplus and leased to a group of citizens organized as the Skyline Park Citizens Association, who turned it into the park it is today. And yet, some of the old hospital structures remain, so now let's talk about some of them. In and around Skyline, some remnants of the past are obvious. For example, if you've parked off of Strublow Drive, and connected to the River to Ridge Trail, did you notice the yes. 1940s incinerator near the corner? These were used to burn garbage and lawn waste and were later banned. Some past remnants are incredibly subtle. For example, at the end of River to Ridge is a kiosk. Turn around and you'll see a couple of palm trees. Now what are palm trees doing in the middle of a forest dominated by oak and buckeye? There must have been something, some structure there at one point. So now let me share with you what I learned about the park. There are four categories I would like to cover. The rest of this video will cover stone walls and water features. Part two will cover structures along and around Lake Murray Road. In part three, we tie up loose ends and try to answer a sad but important lingering question. If you keep your eyes peeled, there are walls all over the park, each built with rocks that appear to be local to the area. And that makes sense. Why haul rocks any further than you have to? The Manzanita Trail crosses one of these walls. Just look at how far it goes. No mortar was used in its construction, just carefully stacked stones. The Manzanita Wall is so prominent that it's visible by satellite, which made me wonder, just how extensive is it? And how many other walls are visible by satellite? So I looked at Google Maps and marked all the walls I could find. Here's the one on Manzanita. And now check out all of these others. These are only the most prominent ones. Imagine how many others there are hidden among the trees. So can we draw any conclusions about how old they are or who built them? One question we could ask is whether any of these walls predate California statehood. Before 1850, Napa was a collection of ranchos like Rancho Tulake. But after 1850, the land got divided up into a grid, essentially, as you can see in this 1876 map. That made me curious to see how closely the walls line up with these property lines. So I created a tracing of the boundaries on the map. And as reference points, I traced the major rivers in blue, the railroad in green, and this ridge line to the east with yellow dots. If you lay this on top of the walls, this is what you get. 
It's not perfect, but we are taking a very old hand-drawn map and laying it on top of a satellite image. There seems to be a decent correlation. But it's difficult to conclude too much about this, however, other than the walls probably don't predate California statehood. Curiously, there's an outlier here, which is curved and on a hillside near the basalt mines. So who built the walls? I didn't find anything concrete on this, except for one tantalizing clue. This photo, which says, Rock City 1966, made by one patient over many years, near basalt in hills. Who was this patient? Where is their handiwork located? We can only guess. For the asylum to be self-supporting, an ample supply of water was needed. The asylum started on 200 acres of land, and to the east were two plots owned by Nathan Coombs, the founder of Napa City. It looks like Coombs had a generous agreement with the asylum to allow access to his water. Also in 1872, the Coombs Ranch Dam was constructed somewhere near a bend in Murray Creek. But the growing asylum needed more. In the 1880s, Superintendent Dr. Wilkins directed the construction of three lakes on the property. Lake Camille, which was originally called Lake Camilla after Dr. Wilkins' wife, was the first lake to be constructed in 1885. A broad avenue lined with beautiful trees was created, which connected the castle with Lake Camille. That is probably today's Madrone Drive. The dam that established Lake Louise, originally called Lake Lucerne, was completed in 1888. And the dam for the largest lake, which is Lake Como, was finished in 1890. There's still water left in Como today, but it's a shell of its former self. Interestingly, these lakes were built almost entirely using patient labor. And sadly, Lake Camille, for whatever reason, was involved in a spate of patient suicides by drowning in the early 1900s. The sides of Lake Camille were said to drop off steeply from a depth of 10 feet to 50 feet within a short distance. Now you've probably seen the structure in Lake Louise that resembles a crypt. That is the Lake Como pump house. It directed water from Lake Como into Lake Louise. Water could also flow from Louise and Como into Lake Camille. Later, in 1908, yet another lake was created, this one about two miles east of the castle. You're all probably familiar with Lake Marie. Interesting story about Lake Marie. In the early 1900s, the asylum's medical superintendent, a Dr. Elmer E. Stone, had a bungalow built near the lake. He stocked Lake Marie with more than 100,000 trout, and according to news reports, he used this bungalow as a private hunting and fishing lodge. He maintained the property with state funds, and entertained friends there using food purchased with state funds and prepared by asylum employees. On top of this, Dr. Stone was accused of embezzling money from the asylum's hay fund, among other things. He resigned in 1912. Okay, to finish the section on water, we need to discuss this. You're probably wondering, what does the old chimney on Skyline have to do with water? There have been a lot of theories about this structure. The current map calls it a mining cabin foundation. I found no evidence for this, unfortunately. And back in the 1990s, some thought it was a sea captain's house. An older version of the Skyline map backs this up, though the location is a bit off. But again, I found nothing to corroborate this. 
The answer comes from a 1982 newspaper article interviewing Ellen Brannock. Brannock was the Napa State Hospital historian for decades, so I put a lot of stock in what she says. Brannock said that this was the Dam Watchman's house. Someone lived here and monitored Lake Marie Dam. By 1920, the water in Lake Marie was no longer needed. It was supplanted by the Rector Reservoir in Yountville. So, the Dam Watchman's house was moved. It was physically relocated to the hospital grounds, where it was eventually replaced with the Francis Cottage. That might not be all, though. I think there's a Dr. Stone connection here as well. An article defending Stone in 1912 said that his bungalow was merely a shack made from refuse lumber left over from the construction of the Lake Marie Dam. And the building, it was said, was really just intended for the watchman at the dam. And in 1920, an article describes a structure being moved from Lake Marie. The term they used for it, interestingly, was bungalow. Thanks for watching part one of this series. In part two, we travel along Lake Marie Road and talk about the various oddities along it. We then go searching for the home of a little giant. Hope you'll join us.